Okay, I think we should go and get started. Other people will hopefully be joining in. So if not, everyone knows how to use their lap meter. So that's great. That'll make Texas school um, take make it easy on a lot of us, right? So <laughs> uh, welcome. Hope you know who I am. I'm Chris Duncan. I'm also joined by Wranglers um, Don Chambly and CJ. I always pronounce his name wrong. Craigio. I think that's right. Um, no one CJ, he's probably in the car right now driving to a job. So that's why his camera's off and he's muted. Uh, but it's Grego, and I am definitely working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, so welcome to this. Um, again, this will be recorded. I'll post it up on the page so you can review it later. Um, this is our eighth year to teach Texas school. Maybe ninth, because 2020, they made us do two of them during the pandemic. We had, we did two quarantine editions. Um, but one of the things that Dan, I've noticed kind of through the years of doing this is that when we get to light meters and when we start doing our assignments in class, um, sometimes we get fumbled by equipment. It's like once we put gear in our hand, we tend to focus on the technology and not necessarily some of the practical applications of our craft. So, um, and we really want you to be able to practice at that time and not be frustrated with your gear. So that's why I thought having this class beforehand might be useful um, to you guys to um, just kind of get up to speed. So I know we have a small group right now, maybe more will join us later, but how many of you have a light meter like this? Yes, no, okay. Did these scare you? Does, it, does this scare you? <laughs> okay. So, well, awesome. Good job, Karina. So uh, Terry went away. He vanished into the teddy bear behind you. But, you know, um, so actually, I I love to cook. And cooking is, you'll, you'll, you'll catch that pretty early on in the class uh, once we start class. Or if you've taken a class from me before, you'll not remember that. But I like to cook, and I put a lot of an, – uh, comparisons between photography and cooking because they're both both subjective uses of an objectional craft right there's some things that are objective in our craft you know uh, proper exposure lighting always does the same thing um, how an f-stop number works right all those are objection they, they they can't change it's always going to be the same now some of it's subjective where i like it bright or i like it moody or i like it high contrast or low contrast all that can be subjective just like cooking, you know, you has to be a certain temperature to cook meat medium rare, right? It has to be this to, to saute an onion. Those are objective things. And then you can decide if you want to cook Chinese food or Asian or uh, Latino or kind of classic American food or whatever, right? Those are the subjective uses. So I do a lot of comparisons between cooking and photography. And so when I get to a light meter, let's say you came home from a long day of work and you had a frozen lasagna that you were going to cook for your family. Um, no judgment. I don't know why you would do that, but no judgment if you're going to cook a frozen lasagna for your family. Um, and the ingredients in the back of the box says 450 degrees for 35 minutes. You have two options. You could either turn the oven on to any temperature you want, throw the lasagna in there, and every so often check it and hope it's done. Or you could do what the box ingredient says, enter that into your oven, set your timer, and then your lasagna is going to be cooked correctly. All right. Which one of those examples sounds more logical? Hopefully it's the second one, right? Well, that's really what the light meter is. It's the instructions on the back of the lasagna box. It's going to give us our time and our temperature on how we're going to cook our food, other than just trying to guess when it's done and when it's not done. Maybe it's undercooked, maybe it's overcooked, and we have to make these adjustments. All right. The light meter is that kind of ingredient for us. And so that's why I think this is really, really important. Um, so I'm going to go over just a few quick kind of um, basics of this, and then we're going to do a demo. And hopefully you're all, not that one, hopefully you can all see this screen here. Um, there we go. So what we use a light meter for is obviously how to determine our exposure. Our exposure is going to become very, very critical. Um, I talk about that a lot again in class. I don't want to spoil too much of the class, but just kind of get you up to speed if this is new to you. Um, this is what we call a handheld or incident light meter. And when you have the dome on it, um, 
it meters 18% gray and 18% gray is our middle exposure and that goes to our camera setting. So this is gonna tell us what to put our camera on. Um, you have a light meter built into your camera. We're not gonna talk about that today. We might hit that on class, but today we're just talking about using your handheld meter. It's also called an illuminance meter because it measures the light illuminating um, it at its subject position. So you use this at subject position. So what is the correct exposure? This is a question I get. Well, I don't know what correct is. And I always say, well, it depends what you're exposing for. And since our class is really based around portraits mostly, um, our exposure is based around the face. And all the other parts of the image kind of just should fall in line with that. We want the face to be an accurate representation of the tone or the brightness, the luminosity, the color, and the texture of the subject. And their clothing, the background, the floor, different things, those can kind of fall into different values based upon the situation we're in. But we're going to base all of our exposure on the face. Okay. So that true tonality is what I call correct exposure. True tonality equals our camera settings. So again, I mentioned exposure is critical. And this is why it's hard to use our eye. We got to use a tool like this because our eye sees 24 stops of range. Um, even in here, I have a window out here. I can see the green outside. I can see the detail of my yard. I can see the black of my tripod in front of me. I can see all that stuff. My eye captures all that detail where we, our camera could not, right? Our camera can capture maybe an eight stop range. Um, some manufacturers claim more, some claim less. Really, it's all hog wooey because our paper holds a five stop. So our workable exposure range is about five stops. And every stop is half or double the amount of light before. It's all exponential, not sequential. All right, so it's one. So it goes one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on, as opposed to one, two, three, four. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, don't worry about this, this will all make sense soon. So when I'm looking at this working exposure, this is just some groundwork of why we, when we're going to start using this and how practically it works. We just talked about that our, that, the, this with the dome on, right, it meters 18% gray. Well, 18% gray is our middle exposure. Why is 18% the middle? Because it's an exponential curve and not a sequential curve. Okay, so we have five stops of workable range um, from our deepest blacks to our brightest whites um, to capture good detail and all of that. That's called our dynamic range. We want all of that to have good detail so it all prints well. Okay, and also that way we don't lose detail on a on a bride's dress and some blonde hair. We don't lose shadow detail. Um, I'm sticking to a wedding example in the groom's tuxedo or anything like that. Um, we want all that good detail from highlights to shadows to, to come through. So if we take a stop less than 18% gray, we have half of that, which is nine. Uh, that's 9%, that's our dark gray. And really what you need to worry about on this is the 4.5%. That's half of nine. That's another stop. So that's two stops away from our middle exposure, which is what we set our camera on. And that's our black with detail. Okay. On the other side, the highlight side, the right hand side of the histogram, we could go up a stop. We double it because remember it's half or double. That's 36%. And then if we double it again, which we're really concerned about is 72%. That's our white with detail. So we can't go above that and have detail in our whites. Now we can go above it and we get the blinkies. Um, that's when our camera blinks at us and that just tells us there's no digital information. There's not a one, there's not a zero. I don't know what to do with this, so that's why it blinks. It doesn't have the ingredients to make to make the image there, okay? Really, we need to worry about three of these values in a working pro. We need to know our middle exposure because that's what we put our camera on. And then we need to understand what our brightest part of the image is. Um, could be the background in this image. It's it's the background you see this chess player, that white background that's part of the light source that becomes the brightest part. And then we have to worry about the darkest part of our image, right? In this instance, it's the shadow side of his face. That's the darkest side. So we have to understand what the light value is there. It could be different. It could be the background, which is a park or a cityscape or whatever that may be, a studio setting you have. And the brightest part could be a light source or a, our clothing. Right. So we have to understand what those brightest values are. And as long as the shadow value and the middle gray are within two stops of each other, it's going to print. 
And as long as the highlight value or the whites and the middle gray are within two tops of each other, it's going to print. So whatever we set our camera on, we know we have two stops above it that can print with detail. And we got two stops below it that can print with detail. And our light meter is going to help us determine all of that because we can quickly move throughout a scene determining these values and relate them next relate them to each other and know if our image is going to print well. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. And so here's just a practical example. I measure meter these parts. Obviously I'm exposing for the face. The face was at 5.6. His shadow detail was in 2.8. So it's going to print with detail. His shirt in the background meter F11. That's within two stops. So I know it's going to print. Now it does push it to white, which I'm okay with, but it's still and it still has good fidelity in the image so that's our working thing okay so when we get to our light meter you really have two modes you're going to use you're going to be flash mode which is represented by the lightning bolt if you don't have a light meter yet um that's how he'll show is a lightning bolt you can't see it on here but there's a lightning bolt on the screen or ambient mode which is usually depicted by the sun or a sun icon if we're going to use ambient mode we're going to put it into time priority ambient mode. Flash mode will only give you time priority because, because the light meter can only measure the flash in apertures based on its intensity. That's a topic for another day. And so if we're going from flash to ambient, I like to have a consistent workflow. So since flash mode only measures f-stops and gives me f-stops, when I set it to ambient mode, maybe I'm working in a natural lighting environment, um, or an ambient lighting environment, I set it to time priority, so it still only gives me f-stop numbers. That way my brain only has to look at one thing. What's the f-stop? And that's what I put into my camera. I don't have to worry about any other values. Just what's the f-stop? That's what I put into my camera. So those are your two options. Some of your meters have other options like time plus ISO. And it, don't worry about those. We just worry about time priority and flash mode for right now. And once you measure it, the meter is going to give you an F number. Put that F number in your camera. It's like cooking that lasagna. You got time, you got temperature, and you got a perfect meal when you're done. So our basic ambient mode is going to be sunny 16 or the basic daylight exposure. Um, possibly you've heard about this. Um, here you may not need a light meter. A light meter will help you fine tune it when you get into overcast or shady areas and maybe to measure how far, how much the light is losing intensity as you get underneath the opening of a canopy of trees or a porch or something of that nature. Um, but it is, you put the shutter speed equals your ISO. So if you're at ISO 250, your shutter would be 1 250th of a second at F16. That's the brightness or the intensity of the sun on a bright sunny day where the sun is hitting your subject's face. So if you put the sun behind them, it's different, where the sun is hitting your subject directly. Just one over the ISO. And then you can adapt this to like cloudy situations. You know, when it's cloudy, it may be the cloudy F8. Same thing. Want your shutter speed equals your ISO at F8 because the intensity of the sun has gone down because the cloud cover reduces the brightness. So here are some basic ambient exposures based on the sunny 16 rule. You'll notice in the middle, we have 1 2 50th at F16. That's the example I just gave you. And it shows here the example is ISO 2 50th. So our exposure is one equal in our ISO at F16. And then from there, you can say, well, I don't want to photograph at F16. Well, uh, it's okay. Then we would just adjust our shutter speed and how our aperture do this. So when we're doing ambient, if you think of ISO as my head, it's going to change both values, right? As my head moves, both values move. One side is my time and one side is my aperture. So in ambient mode, outdoors, um, constant lights, anything that doesn't flash, those are reciprocal. When one changes, the other one has to change the opposite way to maintain a perfect balance. Okay, and that's what this chart represents. Okay, so... Sony 16 is a good testing ground. You can use your light meter to prove that. In fact, using your light meter outdoors on a bright sunny day, I'll let you know if your light meter is calibrated well, because it should read really close to F16 if you go outside. 
and you set your shutter speed to match your ISO. Okay, so here's just some other examples. Like I said, uh, cloudy could be F8, right? Um, don't worry about all this right now. It's just showing you that the intensity of the sun is always the same. It's the atmospheric conditions that change the brightness of it. So that gives us a good constant stake in the ground that we can use when we're working on location. And we'll do a lot in class of adding flash to location lighting. And we have to understand what the sun is producing and what our light is producing to make sure those balanced and they're all within that five stops of workable range. Okay, flash exposure. This is where it gets really different. Right? I, I have a feeling a lot of you are here because you really wanna learn how to balance flash and outdoors, right? And make them not look too flashy, right? To make it all look nice and balanced. Um, and that's a and that's great. And that's one of our favorite things that we love to do. A lot of our work is done on location or at least outdoors. And that's something we're always having to do is understand what the sun is producing and what our, our flash or our strobe is producing and how to balance those together. And so again, our head's the ISO, we have our time and we have our aperture. But now they don't work diff they don't work um, conversely. If you change one, you don't have to change the other. Because now ambient light is controlled by your shutter, your time, and what your flash produces, what the intensity of your flash determines your aperture. So they're completely independent exposure parts or exposure equations now when we're adding flash to a situation. So here we could meter F8, as this example shows, and as our shutter speed changes, it changes everything that the flash doesn't hit the background typically the ambient areas you want the ambient brighter or do you want the ambient darker you change your shutter speed you don't change your aperture now okay that's why it's, that's why when you put this thing to flash mode it only gives you the option to set it on time priority because it's only going to measure the intensity which gives you aperture therefore why i go to ambient mode i like it to stay on time priority so it only gives me the aperture so i'm only looking at one value i'm only concerned about one value no matter what mode this is in okay so let's just kind of do a quick how to use and then i'm going to do a demo on this and then we'll open it up to questions so first is put your meter in the appropriate mode are you using ambient which could be a constant light like right now I'm under constant lights. I got a window, I've got two LEDs. I've got the fluorescent lighting in here. This is all constant lighting. There's no brief, brilliant burst of electronic light, okay? So, or I'm using some type of flash on like a speed light, a studio strobe, off camera flash, whatever it is. If I do have that brief and brilliant burst of electronic light, then I wanna use flash mode. So make sure first you're in appropriate mode, okay? And you'll probably see a mode button and either buttons or dials somewhere on your on your light meter to adjust that mode. Okay. Second, you want to make sure the ISO on your meter matches the ISO on your camera. Okay. Um, those need to match. Then you set your shutter speed. Okay. Um, for flash, I have mine set at 125th of a second almost religiously. Um, the reason being, based on the previous slide, now I have a stop slower to decrease the ambient I could go or a stop faster. I'm sorry. I can increase a, my shutter speed to 250th, a stop slower. Seems faster, but it's less in less light um, to, to make the background go darker, or I can in, or I can decrease my shutter speed to a 60th, which brings in more light. Okay. So that's why I'm at one why I like it at 125th um, for when I'm in flash mode. If you're an ambient, that might depend if you're at a sporting event or if, you're, if someone's being still or, or those different things. But for flash, you really don't want to be a higher shutter speed than that, or you get into high speed sync, which we're not going to cover. Um, then you press the measure button, which is on the side. Make sure the dome is pointed towards your light source. The dome doesn't care where the camera is. It only cares where the light is. Because remember, this is an incident meter, which measures the light striking it. So think if I hit you, if I struck you, there would be an incident, right? So that's all it's going to measure is what's hitting it. So we want to point this towards the light that we're using. 
I'm going to set my camera aperture to match the meter. I've already made sure my shutter speed and ISO match. So I'm just going to set my camera to that ap aperture, and then I'm going to take the great picture. Okay. Sounds really simple when we put it in those, those six, six steps, right? Okay, again, point the dome towards the light source. Again, a second or third reading may be needed throughout the scene so you know how bright the ground is, what the background behind your subject, how bright it is or how dark it is. You make sure that all prints. So we may do multiple readings, but our first one is on the face because we're in a portrait scenario, we're exposing for the face. So that's what I want to set my camera at and everything else will have to fall into line relative to that measurement. Okay. Mm, let me open it up to questions before I go to this. Are there any, are there any questions? And maybe let me check to see if there's anybody in the chat. Nothing in the chat. Any questions? Just feel free to unmute and ask a question if you have one so far. Hey, Chris, do we need to, it's Megan. Do we need to bring our own light meter or like, I don't even, I've never even used one. Do you have one? No. Well, then how can you bring your own? Well, I'd buy my own. <laughs> I would, uh, I wouldn't buy one before Texas school. Um, I think there'll be, we have some that we, we can lend out to different groups. I'm sure someone else has one. I would, Honestly, I would make sure it works in your workflow. It works in my workflow. Um, it's a vital, to me, it's my tape measure. If I was going to be a carpenter, I wouldn't go to a job without a tape measure. It's how I feel about okay. my light meter. Um, but it may not work in your workflow. Your work may be different where it's it doesn't be as, it's not as practical. Um, so I'd definitely okay. wait till Texas school. And if you feel it is, buy it there. You're going to get a better deal buying it at Texas school than trying to buy something beforehand. Okay. I'm actually going to skip this slide now that I kind of think about it. Um, and we'll talk more about that in class because that's probably beyond what we need to do just for this intro class. And so one final thing I love about um, the light meter, and I talked about having a lot of our work is done outdoors and we have to match ambient, what the sun is doing or what the building location may be doing if it's an inside venue versus what my flash is doing, right? There's a lot of different intensities, a lot of different values. Think of that of having a lot of different items you're cooking and they're all at different temperatures. Uh, you've got to determine all those different temperatures, how long it's going to take to cook each one. So when dinner is ready, they're all ready at the same time. Right? That's a lot of calculations you have to do. Uh, maybe you have different ovens and a, and a fire, all these different things. Well, we could have that on a job, right? We have the sun doing this. We have an overhang of a tree that gives us this light quality. Then we put in a flash that gives us this light quality. So we've got all these different temperatures or intensities of light that we have to balance to create a meal that's ready to be served, okay? And so one thing that we have noticed, it's kind of been our, I, I call it our, the you know, like to call it our secret sauce. Um, again, staying with the cooking analogy, right? The food analogy is, we like a 30 to 40%, I know the bold says 30, but a 30 to 40% flash to ambient ratio. And one thing that a light meter will give you that not using it can't is that percentage. And if you're using either one of these meters, um, a Seconic 358 or really later edition, this is probably a 10 or 15 year old, Don, you might can correct me, meter, it's been around a long time, that they've been doing I learned about percentages in 2004. So it's at least been almost 20 years um, that these meters were doing the percentages. Um, some of them don't. Um, different brands, I don't know if they do it, but Seconic, which has kind of been the industry standard, does. And it's going to show you a percent. Oh, why did, why did that about transition? Sorry. Okay, well, I guess I missed the slide. Anyway, in the, in the corner... Of the uh, thing, it shows a percentage. I know you probably can't see that on your screen, um, but there's a percentage up there as long as you're in flash mode. And mm -hmm. if that flash mode says 30 to 40, then that tells me that 30 or 40% of my overall exposure is coming from the flash and the rest is coming from ambient. 
And that becomes really, really valuable when we want to create a balanced scene and nothing looks too flashy. We've probably all seen images on the internet or an image competition or Instagram, wherever they are, where images like, whoa, that's really flashy. We may have even taken some of those images, right? And we've also seen images that seem really, really balanced, right? Like, oh, that looks really nice. It's usually because they probably used a light meter and they incorporated their lighting correctly to get that balanced look. Um, that's one thing we hear over and over a lot from some of our students is your images look just natural. Well, they're not naturally lit. Almost 98% of our stuff is, is lit with some type of auxiliary lighting, right? It's just understanding these exposure values and stuff we've talked about to be able to create that. Um, it doesn't work just inside. It can work. I mean, outside, it can work inside as well. Just something that we follow. Okay, then I was going to question. So um, no questions on that. We didn't have any earlier. So I, maybe not with those other two slides. Do we have any? So I'm just going to do kind of a little demo here and kind of show you how I might use this practically. Okay. Look at that. <laughs> So I'm using a Zikonic 358. Um, if you went and bought a new one right now, it would most likely be the 478. Um, this one is a touch screen. It's a great meter as well. Uh, I'm just, I've had this one a long time, so I'm kind of used to this one. Um, I like the buttons and the dials better than the touch screen. That's why I like this one. They quit making this. Um, I don't know why. It'd be like Toyota saying, I'm not going to make the Camry anymore, but they quit making it. Uh, and so it's all still kind of the same. So I don't know if that's focused on your screen. I'm, can y'all see that? Okay, no, yes, no. Don's saying yes. So you can see that there's a place to put in your ISO. There's a place to put in your shutter speed. It already has an aperture reading because I must've hit the measure button. Um, and up here you see a lightning bolt. Can y'all see that? That means it's in flash mode, okay? So I've got my pro photo flash here um, with the modifier on it. And I've got a pro photo trigger. So I would say, okay, the ISO, ISO on my camera is at 250th. So I'm gonna make sure this matches 250. Shutter speed, I want it 125th, right? I'm at, I mentioned that earlier. I want the dome out. Um, these domes will go in or out. I like it out because most of our subjects are round. The only time you leave it in is for a very specific purpose. We might talk about that in class, but I'm not going to worry about it now. So for 98% of the time, it's going to be dome out. Um, so maybe I'm going to set my subject like this and turn back. The camera could be, you all see where the camera is. So let's move the light. So a lot of times we want to point this at the camera, but we want to remember this measures the light hitting it. So I'm going to point the dome towards the light source. I'm going to press the measure button. And once I do, the aperture goes blank and it's looking for a signal. Once I hit the flash, you can see it popped up. I don't know if you can read it. It says 8.0 and then there's nine tenths. There's a little nine at the bottom. We'll cover this more in class. Um, that means eight and nine tenths. That's almost another one, right? It's almost another one. Um, so I would put my camera at F11 and take the picture. Okay. Let me turn this light down just a little bit so it maybe we can get that to. So I turn the light down. I'll take another one. Hopefully y'all can read this. Now it says eight and two tenths, right? So I turn the light down. So now it's eight and a, close to eight and a third. So that is F9 on our camera. And so I'm going to share this one slide again. And that's kind of what I said I'm going to hit more in class. Um, but that's what this slide is talking about. Our full stops are 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, F8, 11, F16. Our camera measures in these third stops, but our light meter will give us a tenth stop um, that we can't ignore. You can set these light meters to give you half stop or third stop readings. That's all up to you and your personal preferences. In fact, if I look at this meter, the one I use day to day, and I take it, but it gave me F11. So let's just, oh, that's also a higher ISO. So uh, what was that, 250th? 
but they should be pretty close. So now look at notice this one says 9.0. Can y'all read that? And so again, the other one said F8 and two thirds. I mean, sorry, F8 and one third, which is F9. This one is set up to read in thirds and it just gives me F9. So you can set these up however you want to do that. Just notice that that tenth number um, that's on there, depending on which meter you have, you have to pay attention to it, especially if it gets to the low end or the high end of that spectrum. You can really over or under expose your image by up to a stop if you ignore uh, that part. Go. Yeah. That seems simple, right? Any, any questions? Anyone? Unmute, ask a question. Then I want to show you how to use the pro photo stuff we're using in class. Um, okay, no questions. Let me, I'm just going to go on to uh, how I might use this. Uh, this that's pre example measuring the face. You know, if we're photographing here, let's say we've got all these other values we need to, like in a studio setting. Right? So once I press the measure button, it gives me about 30 seconds since it's always looking for a flash. So I'm going to turn this dome back towards the light. Hopefully y'all can see that. So when I hit it, it automatically brings up the number. Okay. If I just kind of turn that dome around, which would be a, kind of like me moving the light, it gives me a different number because it's picking up different levels of the light. Y'all see that? So how practically that might work is I might measure the face, measure the chest, maybe measure the far shoulder. Right? Maybe I'll meter the background. And I'm looking at those values the whole time to know is the face brighter than two stops what the background is. Because remember, I want that to print. And that's kind of my workable range. If I don't want this tummy brighter than the face, the light meter will tell me if the tummy's lighter than the face and by how much. Right? So that's kind of a practical thing of how Sometimes a lot of different meter readings will be made. And you'll see me in class a lot doing face down the body like this. Because I don't like the ground or their legs as bright as their face. I want that light fall off to be nice and gradual. And the light meter will give me those measurements. And I don't have to click the button more than once. I just click it once. And as I fire and move, it gives me those new values as I do that. Okay. Does this help? Hopefully this helps. It helps Don, and he's done this before, so that's good. <laughs> Refreshers are always great. That's right. <laughs> well, where do we put the garlic? That's what I got to ask. Where do you put the garlic? Uh, well, I don't know. Sometimes you season every layer. That's a whole oh, okay. <laughs> Any questions? I know it seems easy watching the demo, so... But does does it at least make sense and maybe not seem as intimidating as maybe it did before? Hopefully that was the that was the intent of of doing this. Again, I did I am recording this, um, so I can uh, I'll post it back to our group, so I can review and put on YouTube as well. No questions. Awesome. So just for our Texas school group, again, um, we are using pro photo lighting in our class. So I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of this. How many of you have used pro photo? Don has, Alex, thumbs up, Chantal or Karina? Yes, you have? Okay, so that won't be a big hurdle, hopefully for you. Um, oh, CJ raises hand, is that a question or means he's used pro photo? I don't know. CJ, do you have a question? You might have hit the wrong. Oh, it's down. You must have hit the wrong okay. So let me go to this. Let me switch my cameras again. Um, so it's is that focused? Okay, y'all can read that. So it says 5.4. Um, this is a B10X. Or, I'm sorry, B10 plus, uh, we'll have these in class. They go from 1.0 all the way to 10. 
Um, pretty self-explanatory on these. They're really, they're really user-friendly and intuitive. Um, 10 is full power. Every whole number is a full stop. So half power, because remember stop is full or half, would be F9, because that's one whole number down. That's one stop of life. So then quarter power would be F8, 16th power, I'm sorry, eighth power would be seven, 16th, six, and so on and so forth. Okay, so every whole number is a full stop. And so that's important. So if you, if you use your light meter and let's say it's F11, and like, whoa, I don't want to be at F11. I want more of a shallow depth of field so that background is focus. Well, what you could do is maybe change your ISO. That might do something. Or if you want to turn down the power of your light, now you know what a, if you want to shoot at F5.6, which is two stops, you could easily change the light by two stops or two whole numbers. Okay. The, the second number after the decimal, the tenth number is just in tenths. So think of a five as a half, as a, half a stop. You know, a six would be two thirds of a stop, a, third, a three would be one third of a stop. Okay, um, so you can adjust it that way. And whole numbers, full stops, um, decimal numbers are tenth stops. And so remember, our light meter showed us that tenth. So that could be, if you want to really dial it in, that can be helpful there, knowing that tenth. And that's really, that's really the main thing of how to set the intensity of this light up. Obviously, the lower number, the more dim it is, the bigger the number, the more bright it's going to be. Um, if you hit the center one, it gives you the menu. One thing you're really going to be concerned about, at least at Texas School, is we have four different groups, sometimes five different groups photographing. There's other classes there that we're photographing with ProPhoto. Um, so you might freak out while your light's going off. Well, somebody else in another class could be using the same channel. So we'll need to know how to change the channel. So if you hit the main button, it goes to the menu and it simply says air channel and you click it and then you have, I think it's a 32, or, oh, this one's 20. One of the other lights, I guess is 32, 20 different channels. So then you can just set it to the channel that works for you. Um, click that and then you just make sure your trigger is set to that channel and all's good to go. So let's see, I put that on channel. Channel four, so then I can change my trigger to channel four. And now it's good to go. Okay. Those are really, um, what you need to know, there's a morning light, you don't need to worry about much, but those are the main things you'll run into at Texas School is changing the power of the light and changing the channel. And on the remote, if there's a button next to channel, you just click that button and it cycles through the channels and it puts on the display what channel it is, so it's real easy to know where you are. Um, so it's a couple different remotes you may have, a couple different lights. It may look a little bit different, but the interface is the same. Um, as far as changing that, some they have changed kind of the fonts and different colors throughout the years, but the interface is really pretty much the same on the on whichever light we have. Most of them would be one just like this. So um, super simple to use those. And then with your light meter, you are all set to create um, some great images. So again, I want to open this up to any questions, concerns, freakouts, light bulbs, any of those moments that we've had in the last half hour or so. And make sure you unmute. So I know you're asking a question. And welcome a few people that came in late. Karina, I think I see you talking, but you're muted. <laughs> I, I was just wondering if that trigger that you have there for uh, your lights, is that like a uh, universal for different cameras? You just, if you have Nikon, you set it to Nikon and then Canon, or do you have like uh, triggers that are specific to, to a camera brand? That's a good question. Um, yes and yes. <laughs> What's that mean? <laughs> okay. Profoto makes, let me grab the other. So we're going to have both of these. So the top of your camera where your hot shoe is has mm -hmm. a big center metal mm -hmm. sensor yes. and then it has three or four or six or different smaller sensors around it. Okay. Correct. Um, Profoto makes one that has a single pin, 
right? So if it has a single pin like this, it works for any camera. All that does is fire the light. It just sends a signal to, to trigger the light. Okay. Oh, okay. Some of these triggers are camera specific because they use TTL. So they need to access the camera's metering system, um, which is a different metering system than this. <laughs> You're letting the computer determine all your exposure for you. Um, to, to, but it has to access that, com that camera's metering system to then talk to the light if it's using TTL or high-speed sync. Okay. In our class, we will not be using TTL or high-speed sync. At least I won't be teaching it. Um, if you choose to use it on your free time, that's up to you. But if you're going to use TTL or high-speed sync, you have to have a trigger specific to your camera. Right. Okay. We have requested Canon, Nikon, and Sony triggers. I don't know if we're going to get a Fuji trigger. I know they make it for Fuji. Sorry, Don. <laughs> <laughs> bring your Nikon to bring your Nikon to class. I will. Uh, I will. <laughs> um, we have requested again Canon. Nikon and Sony triggers, and I will have a few of my personal single pins. So, okay. but if, but if, uh, yep. Um, but if it doesn't, if it has more than one pin on the back, see how that has the uh -huh. five, then you need to make sure it's camera specific. If it just has one, you're good. Thank you. That's a great question. Should have asked. Yes. Any other questions on the light meter and the pro photo? Yes. Chris. Yes, sir. Um, so, some, of, some of the newer um, Canon cameras, I see that the center pin is removed. The The contact for the center pin is removed. I uh, saw it on the 70, I uh, saw it on, I think it was on the 70D, the ADD. A friend of mine bought one and couldn't use my flashes because the center pin was removed so ah that's maybe maybe just, on, a, just a heads up yeah maybe on some uh you said seven seven zero like two numbers yeah two no, two numbered yeah so i know canon their two number designation is more of an amateur camera yeah if it's a single number designation they consider it more of a professional so like the five right. or the, so it could be maybe they removed it on the um that level of line to make you buy their flashes would be my guess that's correct. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. So, so at least for Canon, if your camera is a single number designation, I have not seen that on any of those. So, but the pro photo, the designated remote should probably still work on those. So, I hope. Any other questions? Okay, how about this? Y'all ready for Texas school? I'm excited for <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. It is a great, great week. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, again, I recorded this, I'll post it back in our group. I'll put it on YouTube, I'll send an email with that link. So if you need to revisit it. Um again, I'll I'll hit more of this in class. I know we went over this quick. Um, we're gonna talk more about this in class on how vital I think this instrument is especially when we're trying to create a certain narrative in our images, which we talk a lot about, um, whether we want it really dark and moody or bright and airy, we have to understand what all the light values equal. And you can figure it out and you can do it without one of these. It just may be more frustrating. It may be a longer process. It may cause you to have more post-production time on the back end of your session. And our goal is to kind of eliminate that where you understand exactly um, what, what, where you can predict what you're going to get. That's what we really want our class to do is where you can predict what you're going to get by understanding the objectionable parts of our craft. And then you can take those and use them subjectively to create the type of imagery that you desire and want to do. So with that, I'll close unless we have any other last second questions coming in. Okay. Awesome. We know it all. Well, there you go. So we'll find out in a few days. <laughs> For sure. No, just kidding. We so. know somebody that knows it all. <laughs> Again, thank y'all for uh thank y'all for tuning in today. I hope you found this beneficial and look forward to seeing y'all 
Um, if you're coming to Texas school, I know we have some former students in here that aren't, but if you are coming back to Texas school, look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you at Texas school. Bye-bye.